Welcome to the Buried Treasures Podcast, brought to you by Mazid Uthman, where I interview a new guest every week to discover their journey. I'm Hamza Warsi. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wal mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Jazakumullah khairan everyone for joining us. Um, the man needs no introduction. If you guys want to know his whole LinkedIn profile, uh, go back to Saviors of the Islamic Spirit, uh, part one. Is that the one that I re- read yeah, everything out? Yeah, part one. Yeah. Okay, cool, inshallah. Part one probably has like a thousand plus views anyways because of the LinkedIn uh, reference. Yes. <laughs> uh, none other than Sheikh Saad. Welcome. Jazakum uh, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> no LinkedIn introduction this time. I like that. Inshallah, we'll dissect the LinkedIn today. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I got majority of my questions, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah, mashallah. So, um, you know, alhamdulillah, man, like, you know, you've done so much for us in the community. You've done so much for me as an individual. Um, I just wanted to get to know a little bit more in terms of, like, where you were born and raised, and then we'll kind of go through the rest of it, inshallah. So, so f- bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So, first thing, I want to apologize to my wife. I, I realized that this kameez is uh, a little wrinkled. I didn't know it was in the video. So, uh, <laughs> she's probably going to get upset later. So, that, that apology is given. Second, uh, shout out to... Is it called Shai or Jai? Shai. Shai tea. It's really good, mashallah. Really, really mashallah. good. So uh, if you guys haven't stopped by there yet, I don't know if I can do this if it's going to violate some Masjid Uthman. Uh, nah. You can edit it out later then. Uh, no, you're fine. Okay, <laughs> cool. Um, so born and raised Park Ridge, Illinois, Lupin General Hospital, which I think most desis I know are born in that particular hospital. Um, raised in Chicago for the first nine years of my life. Moved to Lincolnwood. Um, until I was, I went to mother's at IE when I was 17. Okay. Then I pretty much started dorming at IE, come home on the weekends, until that final year where I didn't come home on the weekends. I stayed uh, as much as I could there. Then I moved out to DeKalb for, I want to say it was two, two years. And yeah, so that's, that's a bit simple con- uh, chronology. Got married, moved to Cortland. Which no one knows about Cortland. It's near yeah, DeKalb. where is that? Yeah, it's near DeKalb. Oh, and then <laughs> the only other that, place I know is Sycamore. Yeah, well, there's Sycamore, then there's Cortland. So oh, it's you, past yeah, it. It's, yeah, it's past it. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. And then, uh, and then back to Bloomingdale, to Lincolnwood, to Chicago, to Lusaka, Zambia. Yeah, and then uh, to mo- to Greenfield, Wisconsin, and just to Glendale Heights last week. Okay, Glendale, nice. Marshall. Yeah. So okay, you you said you went to IAE. Mm-hmm. Okay, why did you go to IAE? When I was, um, how old was I? I think these tapioca balls are really going to get in the way of the interview. <laughs> uh, when I was, um, I think I was 15. So I was heavily involved in MINA, Muslim Youth of North America. I'm going to say MINA, it's like those types of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I was involved in MINA, at one of the MINA ISNA conventions or conferences at the main ISNA convention, um, there's a scholar, and I don't know if I should mention the name or not, so I'm just not going to, because I don't know if you'll be ups- uh, unhappy or not. Fine. But we had a very random conversation after a main session with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. And Sheikh Hamza, at this time, I had heard him for about two years, and that was the first switch from activism for me. Growing up, is all activism. My father is very, very big in the Sunday school unit, uh, circuit, I should say. Uh, chairperson of the weekend schools, taught Sunday school for as long as I can remember. We graduated Sunday school. We started assistant teaching right away. Started teaching after that, and then you know, uh, MYC, MMYC, all these local youth groups, um, similar to YM mm-hmm. before YM before YM's day, like uh, what was that? Um, YMMA. Yeah, YMMA. Yeah. Yeah, and there was another group that that came out of uh, IFS. What was that one called? I thought that's what it was. Is that YMMA? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is that it? I thought they had a different name. Yeah, it might be YMMA. Um, and so, um, yeah, they were YMMA, exactly. Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, in this activism, I really began to feel like something was missing. Mm-hmm. And this I really, may Allah reward, uh, uh, see the uh, Dawood Walid, like his book, Sacred Activism, is really essential for anyone who's, who's active within the Muslim community. And so I wanted to find this other part of my life. And I was looking back, someone recently sent me an email where like I resigned from my position in one of these youth groups mm-hmm. and citing like there's something missing. And then the person said, well, do you still feel this way? And I was like, I don't, I still do and I don't. But um, at that ISNA convention, it was in Chicago. It was 1990, 
94, I believe. Um, it was 93, 94, so I guess I was only 13. Um, after Sheikh Hamza's talk, I sat down with this particular scholar. It was 96. It was 96, yeah. And uh, I sat down with him, and he, we just started talking. He wasn't a scholar then. And he just began to mention all these things because he was with Sheikh Hamza in a Rihla program for 40 days. And he mentioned so many things. I'm like, man, this is what I've been looking for. Mm-hmm. Like, I want to have this other part of the deen, things that he's been speaking about, Sheikh Hamza and others. Um, I want to study with teachers. I want to know about spirituality. And a lot of my friends at that time began memorizing Quran. So I was a junior in high school, and I began to think, I want to go do this. So I'm a very stubborn person. When I want to do something, I, you know, I went, I spoke to my deans. Um, they said, okay. I spoke to my counselor. I spoke to my parents, got their blessing. I was a few credits short, so I had to take some summer school classes, some um, um, homeschooling type classes with a, with, a, with a program. And I got set, and I went to IE. And that was pretty much because everyone else was doing it, but I was looking for something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, And I still remember that the first week, I still remember my bunk bed was uh, right next to a window. I was on the top bunk. And that was like for the few months that we had beds and we sort of switched to the floor. I would look out the window and I would just look and I would just think, I can't believe I'm here. And I felt like I began to find something there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Mashallah. So then you mentioned that other friends were there with you mm-hmm. and that's why you chose to go to IAE. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Nice. Mashallah. So, and what you were doing there was Hibs memorization. Initially, it was memorization. Then it became memorization. So I went double-minded. I wasn't sure should I study like ilm mm-hmm. or should I memorize Quran, which is a type of study of ilm anyway. Um, and then I ended up just deciding to memorize. That first year was relatively pure memorization. But the second year, it began to include Arabic classes and fit classes. And by the third year, I think it was mostly, I think I revised the entire third year there. I didn't uh, memorize anything new. And it was just focusing on like Zat Talibin and Nur al like some introductory books, mm-hmm. Arabic, Medina course series, things like that. Am I close to the mic enough? Or yeah, yeah, you're cool? fine. Um, so during your HIVs, you said in your first year, how much were you able to accomplish? Oh, not much at all. My first year, I mean, I don't want to say not much because someone may have accomplished and less. I don't want to put them down. But for where I wanted to reach my first mm-hmm. year, I only reached the six jizz. Okay, I'm sure. Yeah. And um, I remember, <laughs> I. I still remember the first, I flew through 30 jizz, and then I was given my first sabak was like two pages mm-hmm. for first jizz. And I'm like, oh, okay, I guess this is going to be easy. And then I just hit a wall right there, and I never <laughs> recovered. And I wish I asked someone, how are you supposed to memorize Quran? Because 30 jizz I pretty much knew anyway. Mm-hmm. And I wish I asked someone there, I wish I asked, was this normal? And I wish I recognized that if you can't reach the full one and a half or two pages I was given, um, that you could just, it was one and a half pages, that you can still do whatever you can. Mm-hmm. And uh, the guys I saw succeed over there were guys who definitely were consistent, even if they did small, small portions daily. Mm-hmm. I wasn't that type of person. <laughs> one, one time in three years, one time in three years, I... Almost went the full week rem- rem- reciting all the the uh, the, the al khbar and amukta, but then my last uh, amukta that, that week I failed. But so I never got all my assignments done in one week, which is not a good thing. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, so y- you mentioned that you were living on campus the duration of these three years, correct? Mm, for for six days out of the week, yeah. Six days out of the week, one well, day you'd go home. Monday through Saturday. And then Saturday, we'd go home. We were supposed to come back Sunday night. In- initially, we did come Sunday night. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we were the older students, so we would just come Monday morning. Yeah. Oh, nice. Mashallah. And then you ended up staying on the weekends during your third year. Yeah, I wanted to get as much, as done, much done as possible. So I asked my parents, and they said, okay. So I would stay on the weekends. And at this point, you're still memorizing, and you're doing kitabs at the same time? Yes. Okay, so what books were you covering? We're doing Zat Talibin, so Provisions mm-hmm. for the Seekers. Yeah. We're doing Nur al Light of Clarification. We're doing the Medina Course Series. Um, we did some Fiqh al um, as well. What else did we do? Um, I forgot what else we did. Um, we did some other Arabic books. I always forget mm-hmm. the titles of those books. We did like other books where we worked on handwriting and worked on conversational Arabic. Non ahlan wa sahlan, right? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> that came later. I think that developed later. At Arabiyat and Nashi'in or something. I can't remember what the title was. Okay. Yeah. So then you you're spending this time 
going through these kitabs mm-hmm. and what kind of made you shift focus or go back to school? My parents. <laughs> they, <laughs> they forced me to go back to school. <laughs> okay. Uh, so then what did you go to school for? So how much did you accomplish within those three years? Like in terms of memorization? In terms of memorizations. And you said finishing up books, it was minimal or were um, you able to accomplish a decent amount? You know, because I wasn't really... Um, I was speaking to a brother yesterday about how focus-driven he is. I'm not goal-driven. I'm not objective-driven. I'm a kind of guy who can just be somewhere, and it's not a good quality. Um, And I can pretty much just enjoy what I'm doing there and just move on and not have accomplished anything. And so with IAE, I was just enjoying um, whatever it gave me at that point. Mm -hmm. And so it was the opportunity to memorize the Quran, memorize uh, a little more than half the Quran there. I technically did. I mean, I can't claim that. Um, and then, um, you know, worked on the Jaweed there. So there were definitely, like, my, my, my parents and I had this conversation after I had left. Um, and I, I had, you know, displayed some regret about t- not taking advantage of that time there. And they said that you don't see it, but we see the change that occurred mm-hmm. when you went there. And in hindsight, uh, I think everyone has to be aware of the fact that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts you somewhere, it's best for you. Because mm-hmm. before that, I was supposed to go to Syria. I was, to see it, I was 17, my parents and I made an agreement. We said, um, this was, I was 17, so it was 1998, the year before I graduated high school. And the agreement that we made was, I can go to Syria to study for four years, and then I have to come back and go to law school. So I was like, okay, you want me to, me to be a lawyer, I want to go to Sy- Syria, we'll work this out, okay? Um, for some reason, Syria fell through. Mm-hmm. I don't know what exactly fell through, maybe I wasn't serious, maybe I didn't push it enough. And then I eventually sort of fell back. And I, so my friends were there, so it was comfortable to go there. Mm-hmm. But another friend of mine, he was supposed to go to Medina University. I was supposed to go to Syria. And both of us end up at IE at that time. Um, and I think because I came almost as a, uh, I, I came unprepared, mm-hmm. I never really had a clear objective while I was there. And alhamdulillah, still took, Allah still blessed uh, sure. us along the way. So how would you say, th- what difficulties... Or if any, did you face while studying, dorming, <laughs> locally? Okay, so um, um, the first thing was um, obviously people miss home. I don't think I really missed home, but I missed the comforts of home. Um, like I, I knew um, what I mean by not missing home, but missing the comforts of home. Like I knew like I was growing up, I'm not going to be home my entire life. Mm-hmm. And so that wasn't something I was wrestling with. But I miss like having a restroom that I felt was clean enough to use. I'm very anal, no pun intended, when it comes to using restrooms. Like I have to, I can't use public restrooms. I really struggle mm-hmm. with those types of things. So here at IE, and then sometimes the little kids sneak in and they use the <laughs> older kids' restroom. Like I, I couldn't use it. So then I would stop eating. So I wouldn't eat meals throughout the week. I would try to just, if I had some snacks or if I had like uh, just a small amount of um, uh, food, whatever I can just survive on. And uh, that would help me uh, eliminate the use of the restroom. So that was a struggle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's really, it's first world issues. I mean, I remember when I was in Zambia, and we'll get to that later, like, the people would die for food. Mm -hmm. And here I am, like, selectively not eating, so I don't have to use the restroom. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know, what else was there? You know, we were at a time of transition at IE. And what that basically means is that um, you have the shift from the 1048 building to the 1280 building. Mm-hmm. Um, and that required the older students to step up. And uh, I'm not going to pretend like I was a sacrificial lamb in any way because we wanted to, because you're older, get out and ditch class, etc. So we would go on these trips with the teachers to go and get different things to help uh, maybe get furniture or get different um, materials for the for the for the 1280 building to be built Mm -hmm. when we when when it was abrasive technologies when that was purchased that was just a warehouse Mm -hmm. and then Qari Noman's father Allah he sort Mm -hmm. of came by and just tore the whole thing up and you know (laughs) that that's like his one one of his many parts of his parts of his legacy that he's leaving behind um so that was technically a problem because yes we weren't in class all the time but um, one thing I remember, Qari Abdul Rahman, Mawad Abdul Rahman, uh, Hafizullahullah, uh, anytime we went on these trips with him, at the end he would say, Mawad Abdul Rahman, Mawad Abdul Rahman, Mawad Abdul Rahman, Ever grateful. 
And then he would make all these duas. He would say that, you know, Allah, pakka hafiz benai, pakka hafiz benai, all these things. And I remember the group that we would go with, <coughs> that group that would go, so it would probably be five or six of us, all but two became hafiz. And so that other brother who hasn't in myself, I have, I have hope based upon seeing this dua accepted uh, from our teacher that inshallah eventually we'll also <laughs> get there. Inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. So I don't think it was a difficulty per se. Okay. Now there's one story that comes to mind and uh, it was when you were serving food one time. And this is something that I just rem- I like I randomly remember when I was younger. Okay. Can you tell us that story? <laughs> I can. Um, so like there's no like karama happening over here. Like there's no miracle. <laughs> like I don't have if I did this tea would remain full the whole time because it's very, very good, mashallah. Uh, there's bubble tea, but it's 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 declined. So there's no karama happening over here. Um it was at one of the gatherings where we came back um after so we didn't graduate. I didn't graduate from I um uh, but when the former students would come back and visit. Mm-hmm. Um w- Myself and I don't know if I should be mentioning names of people. I'm really not mentioning it right now. What? Uh, it's up to you. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Um, so Hafiz Azam Hashmi, mm-hmm. he and I were serving food to this uh, initial alumni gathering, and when we were serving food, like uh, we had two pans of biryani, and there was like about 70, 80 people there, and we're thinking, how are we gonna get through all this with th- this many guys? So we're serving, 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 and then. Uh, and I believe Azam was serving, so I don't think my hand touched that <laughs> at all. And so then he, uh, we turned to each other. We're sort of like, okay, we need to get that next pan going, like open it up and mix it up. And and he can attest to this. If he, if we get him on the phone right now, I'm sure he'll attest to this. Um, we uh, were mixing it up. Uh, we we were, we were he was serving, and as we were about to open the other, remove the aluminum foil, we looked down and like n- the food was still there. Like, no food had left that, that container, or very, very little food had left mm-hmm. the container. I remember seeing that. And later, when you study Shemaya, the Prophet, you, you learn about how barakah can be put into food. And I'm, I, I'm sure that gathering was all saying bismillah when they ate, and they all were in wudu, et cetera. So there's a lot of barakah there. So th- I think that's the story you're referring to. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, in terms of, like, brotherhood and what you built, what did you see from... I know you had previous relationships with your friends, but what type of bond did you form living together? <laughs> um, definitely, like, um, m- most of the brothers that w- I, uh, with whom I studied, I um, can say I have not kept in touch with them. But I feel like that period of time was so strong that even if I never, even if I never um, email them or text message them, if I see them, I feel like we can pick up where we left off. Because... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're you're memorizing Quran together, and you're you're just a bunch of young adolescent men in a, in the dorm. You know, you have your battles in the basketball court or on the football court because we played football on the basketball court. Um, you had all the craziness that would happen, <laughs> uh, most of, most of which I don't think I can mention over here. <laughs> um, the wrestling, etc. So there is a bond that you form because you're doing it for Allah. Like mm-hmm. we were all there, these older guys, and I think that was the one year where I really. Um, had an influx, <coughs> excuse me, of older students. And those older students, they really began to uh, bring a new, I have one here. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, um, I was grabbing the Okay, that's cool, yeah. <laughs> um, they really began to um, <coughs> uh, push themselves to do something at a, at a more advanced age. Most students who, you, like my kids I'm are memorizing right now, they're young. They started their memorization young. Here we are, you know, knocking on the door of 20, looking to start memorizing, and it, it was something that's probably not very uh, practical. It's definitely not ideal, but we did it, and I think that's what helped us have this bond. And when I see those guys, um, it makes me happy just seeing them. Like, oh. yeah. So then afterwards, when you left, I, uh, you enrolled at NIU, or...? Yeah. Did you get your GED or you finished your, you had enough credits? I had, I had enough credits. I was two classes short. I did the American school thing mm-hmm. where I just did correspondence courses for two, uh, for one and a half courses. I had to do one semester of something with, uh, co- something with commerce. What's it called? I don't know. And then one class on something. I don't remember what those classes were. Um, anyway, I, um, I, I finished and I, I, I ended up going back the day of my graduation. I walked across stage with my classmates, which was weird because I hadn't seen them all year. Yeah. And then there I am walking across stage with them, which was nice. It was like mixed feelings on that. 
<laughs> because like you know then um because i began wearing a kufi in school mm-hmm. when i was at the end of my freshman year so people knew i was muslim mm-hmm. but um I mean, allah gave me tawfiq for that but now here i come back and i have a beard I, I had like when I had hair back in the day, like you know, <laughs> like the zulf going and yeah. like, whoa, what happened to you? And I was like, nothing, just where have you been? <laughs> like, I've just been in my little cave over here. Nice. So I, um, so I did graduate. Nice, mashallah. And then you ended up going where to school? I went to NIU, Northern Illinois University, the Harvard of the Midwest. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> most people will uh, know it for many reasons. Uh, out in DeKalb, Illinois. Nice, mashallah. Yeah. And you were, what were you initially studying there? I was studying English. I was an English major oh, from the very start beginning. Start to finish. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was a uh, we went we had a little back and forth at home. My parents wanted me to do something that would be more productive and beneficial, like law. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just couldn't wrap my head. For me, like you know, Syria didn't work out, so I'm not bound by that agreement anymore. <laughs> so um, I didn't. Uh, I ended up just pursuing English. I liked. I d- I didn't know what to pursue. Mm-hmm. So I just thought, okay, this is something I sort of enjoy. Let me just go into. It. So it's English with the with the hope to go into education. That sort of fell through later. And what year was this? 2001. 2001. Yeah, right before 9-11. 9-11 was my first year on campus. Nice. My first semester on campus. Yeah. You had a beard, dopey, everything. Oh, my God. I get to campus. <coughs> excuse me. And we live on 411 Normal Road, Apartment 3. Shaq, John Yeah. myself, and, uh, and, and Mabruk, Allah yarham, who is my roommate. I mean, he passed away that, that, that I mean, his, his anniversary of passing away just occurred last week. Um Man, so it's been 19 years since he passed. Mm-hmm. So um, we were um, we were on the same block on normal as the masjid, and I, so I began to go to the masjid. And when I began to go to the masjid, um, I still remember the the brother Atif. He was the MSA president, and I think Saadia was the, the the she was the vice president. Anyway, no, no, she, no, she was the treasurer, I believe. Mm-hmm. And uh, she was the treasurer. Sorry, I forget now. But um, there I am. I'm coming to the masjid, and so the MSA president pulls me aside, and he's like, do you want to be vice president of the MSA? <laughs> I'm like, second week freshman at the university, mm-hmm. and he's like, I'm like, yeah, I, I, I guess, no problem. And because I had a beard, I had a dopey, I had wore kami- I always wear kameez and pants. Mm-hmm. That was my normal attire, kameez and pants, was my normal attire. Uh, only like for like this after coming back from Zambia that I started just wearing like shawar kameez, that white all the time. But I would just wear it like I'm wearing right now, like whatever charcoal pants with the beige coming something like that yeah um and so i guess i looked religious um and so yeah i, I was there looking like a muslim on campus and 9-11 happened maybe a couple weeks later yeah oh wow yeah that's wild so in 2001 also is that when you met sheikh Hussein? i did meet him that december yeah december so 13 2001 so this is after you already begun your education there yeah yeah because okay. uh, yeah yeah yeah. Okay, Osha. Can you tell us about that, the first time meeting him and a little bit of, I mean, he doesn't need any introduction or background. Yeah, so Osha those of you who are not familiar with Sheikh Hussein Abdul Sattar, he's a, by profession, he's a pathologist uh, at the University of Chicago. And he also um, is the founder and the, um, the Amir, I think is the best way to describe mm-hmm. sacred learning, uh, which is a, both an, a virtual um, uh, program and a now a brick and mortar program with the masjid being constructed Inshallah. in Lincolnwood. So for me, how I met him was I was, uh, I, it was Ramadan in 2001, so 2001. Um, and Ramadan 2001, we, um, different people sign up for iftar. At different uh, days of the uh, uh, the last uh, of the entire month, but so my roommates and I we signed up for the last, I think it's the twenty third of Ramadan that we were going to provide iftar that night, mm-hmm. and <coughs> well, I, um, I'm going to fast forward to the story. But I had to like drive down from DeKalb to Devon to Italian Express then, which is wow. like the only like restaurant that you can really go to <laughs> back then, and uh, pick up a I put like ten stuffed gyro pizzas. And drive them back, and we get there. We serve the pizza, etc. And you know, at that point, it's really weird because I had left Madrasa in uh, August of 2001, but I wasn't really a practicing Muslim. I looked the part, mm-hmm. but I mean, my prayers and uh, these—I mean, I fasted in Ramadan because you're supposed to, but I really lost touch with a lot um, when I got to college. And Alhamdulillah, <clears throat> one of the the barakah of the Sunnah, I, I really believe. Like, you, you know, there's certain lines that you can't cross because you look a certain way. Mm-hmm. I think that was definitely there <clears throat> in my life. Um, 
And so um, that day we served the iftar. And then uh, that night is when my roommate becomes sick. And unfortunately, you know, we he ended up passing away. It was a very traumatic incident for for myself and for, for Shaquille, my other roommate. Um, and so when he passes away, literally passed away in my arms. I was doing CPR on him. Can while you sh- he, share that with us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no problem. Yeah, that's, yeah. It's like a... Cause I, f- I mean, like you mentioned it right before, and I'm assuming listeners would want to know what happened. Mm. So Mabruk was a very special uh, individual. I was 20, he was 21, Shaq was 20, almost 22. Um, it was actually just Shaq and I had the apartment. And then we sort of realized that we need a third person because we can't make rent. <laughs> so he reaches out to Abdul Wahid, like a mutual friend. Abdul Wahid tells us about Mabruk and so like, hey, move in with us, get him out of the dorms, etc. I mean, if I were to tell you all the craziness that occurs in on campus, uh, I mean... We like we had a car wash. Like we owned our own car wash. I was just gonna ask you about <laughs> that. It was like on my mind. I'm like, man, the car wash. Yeah, <laughs> we, had, we had that. We had, I used to work at UPS at night. Shaq used to work somewhere at nights. I my shift began at 2 a.m. Um, like you know, we had a situation where I mean the insanity. Like it could become a sitcom if we if we ever go down <laughs> that path. Like I tell my I always tell my students from high school that look, college is gonna be definitely different. Uh, we had a duck. We had a pet duck. That we found on the road. Um, do you guys have a chick with it as well? Uh, no, we do not have a chick with it. <laughs> okay. um, I went, what, what's a baby? A duckling, yeah. It's a duckling. The, du- the duck's mom was crossing the street, and all these ducklings were behind it. And it tried to hop. the. It, it jumped onto the curb right in front of our car wash. Yeah. And then the other ducklings were sort of trying to hop the curb and then onto the curb. And then they and all the cars stopped to let them go past. This one guy cuts off all his cars and wipes out like five of them. The mom oh, sees wow. it. And so one of the ducks was injured. So we picked up that duck. The other ones passed away. The mom left with whatever duck still, a duckling still survived. So we had a lot of craziness. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, if I were to go through them with you, I think we'd be laughing for the next two hours. But I don't know if our listeners really care for that. So anyway, Mabruk was there. Um, he was there pre-car wash. Um, and he was a very, very interesting interesting individual because he was very open about himself and he was very proud of, uh, uh, to be Muslim. At the same time, he wanted the world to know about Islam. And, uh, and it didn't matter how. I remember once, because uh, at that point, I was MSA president, I believe. Was MSA? No, I was MSA vice president. I became president shortly later. And then, alhamdulillah, I was sort of removed from that after that. Um, um, he's like, hey, Saad, look, I have a perfect idea. This is... Uh, this is after 9-11, mind you. Mm-hmm. He's like, I'm going to, you know, like a hatla. I'm going to wrap it around my head like a Palestinian scarf. Yeah. And I'm just going to run down the, like the, the, the commons. And I want you guys to chase after me as <laughs> if like I'm a terrorist. And then I'm just going to sit down and I'm start giving dawah. And I'm like, whoa, Mabruk, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know if that's a good idea or not. Uh, but he was very proud of his deen. Uh, may Allah reward him and um, forgive him. Um, so he, we were... Um, we had, uh, after the iftar, um, he was feeling sick. He started feeling sick. And so I remember very clearly that um, it was, f- final exams were next week, but I had one final that next morning. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, he's just like, oh, I'm not feeling well. And it wasn't, it wasn't such that, um, he wasn't showing signs of sickness. Just like, I'm not feeling well. Like, oh, I'm not, he's just moaning a little. So Shaq had to get ready to go to um, work, and Tom, Tom Shinoy, and uh, Tom Shino and Minoy were our neighbors, <coughs> uh, Malayali, uh, you know, Indian Christians, um, wonderful people, mashallah. Uh, uh, Allah, Allahumma yahdihim ina sirat al-mustaqim. They're wonderful, mm-hmm. wonderful people. Um, so they're like, hey, look, he feels sick. Just send him over to our place. We had nothing. We had a computer table, and then we had nothing. At least there, they had like they had a futon and they had like video games and everything. Like we would often pop in on them. <laughs> uh, interesting. Uh, uh, Tom, who was also uh, Indian Christian, he would use a lota. Oh wow! Yeah, he said it's just cleaner. Nah. He's like, he's just, it's he just does cleaner. the istinja. Yeah, he does istinja. <laughs> he's like it's cleaner. You Muslims have it right. <laughs> so uh, and how we met them is interesting as well because it was right after nine eleven. A uh, bunch of the football team of NIU before NIU became good, uh, they uh, came to our apartment. Mm-hmm. Because you have three Muslims living there. But they saw Tom, Shino, and Minoy 
And they were, I think, a little drunk as well. And they're desi, and we're desi. Mm -hmm. And so they thought, like, that they were us. And so they went to attack them. And these guys are big. And so they beat up the football players. And the football players all left. <laughs> and so, like, bro, we owe you one. Like, and then after that, we became really, really cool. Nice. Um, so I'm um, like, hey, let me stay over to our place. Um, we'll just watch over him. I would check in, uh, I'll check in on him just while I'm studying. <clears throat> and um, what, one of the things I remember was that uh, it wasn't manifest, any type of sickness. And around midnight, Tom's like, hey, bro, let's just take him to the ER, go to Kishwaukee Hospital. Let's just see if something's wrong. So we, um, we took him there. When we got there, um, the, uh, he's like, oh, I'm not feeling well. I'm sick. They took his temp. It was like 99.1. It was barely what we consider fever. So they gave him some, uh, some uh, they gave him an IV, tried to just bring the temp down. They gave him some medicine. And I remember, I, I'm sitting there trying to study for my for my uh, anthropology exam. I don't know why I was taking anthropology, but I was taking an anthropology class. And um, one of the things that I was, I was like, man, I have to study, and I'm not getting any study done, studying done. So we get back, and Tom's like, hey, let him st sleep at our place. We got the we got the futon. He can sleep over there. I'm like, perfect. I go to my, my apartment just across the hall. Uh, Shaq comes back a little later. I'm I'm studying, and I just, I might have to go to sleep now. My class was uh, 8 a.m., and so... By seven something, I was up, and I'm like, I gotta be, I gotta be out the door. So I go, and even Mabruk had come once in the middle of the night to get some clothing, etc. Um, and it was just one of those things where I just couldn't tell, like, why is he acting so sick when he doesn't appear sick? Mm -hmm. um, well, Shaq calls me afterwards. He's like, Hey, we're, we're, um, they went to the, they went to, went to the clinic again, and then uh, he's like, Let's just take him home. Let's drive him home. He can be with his family. They can take care of him. He's not feeling well. We have to study for finals as well. We can't take care of him. We're not equipped to take care of him anyway. Like, <laughs> we just like we could barely take care of ourselves. But in, in particular, to have uh, if he's sick, so we were getting to, uh, ready to take him when he did. Um, when you know he's like, I'm Allah, I need help, and I'm sick, and um, someone just takes him your medication. When he took his medication, that's when he began to choke. And so I had to, I'm like, is he fooling around? He began to do this, which is the <coughs> universal sign of uh, 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 of choking. So I began to do the the Heimlich maneuver on him, but it didn't work. And you know, you, you we we were, I was certified in CPR because we learned it in high school, and we had to take it every year in eighth grade, it's seventh grade, eighth grade, freshman, sophomore. We had to took it m multiple years, mm -hmm. and so. Like in the movies, on TV, in any type of ideal situation, you save the life. So I was doing it, just waiting for that pill to pop out, and then all of a sudden he collapses. And this is not this is not what the script would have. So I roll him over, and um, we had to start CPR. Tom just came back from work, and he worked at a medical uh, office. So I'm like, "Hey, Tom, get over here." Shaq called nine one one. We began to do CPR. I was in chest compressions. Tom was about to work the mouth to mouth. Then we switched because chest compressions gets tiring. So I switched to the mouth. I, and at that point, I realized I can't do mouth to mouth on him. Um, just physically at that point, he wasn't allowing me to do it. And um, uh, so um, I got on the phone with the operator trying to instruct me. I'm like, look, I can't do it. There's, there's this obstruction here. And so um, he said, help's on the way. And then when, when help came, the police officer arrived before the, the paramedics, and he also felt that obstruction. He couldn't get air in. He finally got some air in. And um, we rushed him. Then the paramedics came. They said, follow us. We rushed him to the ER. And same place we were the night before. And about 15, 20 minutes, 20 minutes later, um, the, uh, the nurse and the doctor, I remember the doctor even said, like, he couldn't tell us. He's like, you tell him. And so she said, are you family? And Shaq told me, like, you have to see your family. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, fine. We're all cousins in the end, right? Like, so, like, what's the difference? So, yeah, we're family. And so she said, I'm sorry, he didn't survive. And it's not the words you expect. Because and that's not how it ever happens in any type of Hollywood, Bollywood, whatever, like, scripts mm -hmm. are out there. You always expect a person to survive. Well, he didn't survive. And um, uh, Mabruk's father was being driven up at that time, um, and we had a second issue that he had meningitis. Because he had meningitis, um, um, and, and so what ended up happening was he had meningitis. The, the physician the night before didn't catch it. The hospital was, was li liable, and alhamdulillah, eventually they were found to be liable uh, because they missed the, the meningitis. Like They just treated it like it was a common cold. Um, he said, since especially you, according to me, you were doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth on him, you could have meningitis as well. It could be bacterial or viral. 
Mm-hmm. And then I didn't know the difference. So the doctor basically said, like, okay, well, if it's one of them, I can't remember which one it is. I think it's if it's bacterial, you can take this medicine, and it'll 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 you'll you'll, you'll be fine. But if it's viral, then he just stopped. So I remember like, if it's viral, what? And he just looked down, and then I'm like, so we're gonna die? Is that what you're telling me? And then he just sort of looked down and sort of shrugged. So we got taken back, and they had to do this. And they had to like stick this metal thing through our nasal cavity. And by the time all that was done, we came out. This is Ramadan. We're still fasting. Uh, you know, we come out, and it's night outside. And Mabruk's family was waiting for us, and Dad spoke to us. And then we just went, we went down to Chicago. Uh, I went down to my parents' place in Lincolnwood. And it was a bit of a rough night. The next day was a janaza. And for a couple of days, like, I didn't really know what to do with myself. Um, uh, one of our friends, Ahmed Sikander, whose father just passed away, Allah, mm-hmm. uh, had an iftar party. So I went, but it just was one of those things where I didn't want to be anywhere. And uh, so finally, I just thought, I'm going to go to a masjid. So it was a masjid that just opened up nearby. Like, it used to be located on Damon. It got moved to Peterson and Lincoln because of the fire. And uh, there was an etikaf program happening there. So I just wanted to go be an etikaf. Uh, just opening like a year or so prior. Mm-hmm. So I went to Etikaf, and that's where I met Sheikh Hussein. And there's a bunch of brothers there who are perf- performing Etikaf. And it was weird because, like, you know, they were like doing dhikr and they were like reading Quran, but like because they wanted to, not because they had to, <laughs> which is very weird for me. You know, Sunday school, may Allah reward the founders of Sunday school from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that um, I remember, I always felt it was very, um, it was very, um, uh, g- it was very much geared towards those individuals who had a love towards Dean. But if you didn't have love towards Dean, it didn't necessarily h- create that. Mm-hmm. And so, um, um, uh, we will learn about about a lot about repercussions, uh, but not necessarily about like, love for Allah. And Sheikh Hussein was giving uh, uh, like talks after prayer, after Isha, and after Fajr, <coughs> and he he was covering the Shema of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so I remember, like, people were talking to him, so I thought maybe I should talk to him. So I went and I go, so I went to sp- speak to him, told him what happened. And we knew each other from before, but not, like, that well. I, w- I was a child of the community. He was a child of the same community. I remember when he would come back from his uh, his uh, studies in, in Syria and then Pakistan when he would come to visit. Um, so that's when my first time meeting him. And at that point... Um, I remember he gave me some really good advice. I th- gave it to someone recently. I forgot who it was. <sighs> someone passed away recently. I gave it to them. But he said, look, it's, re- it's a tragedy what happened. But the greater tragedy is that if you, um, if, um, uh, if you don't change because of this. Mm-hmm. And those are words that really had an impact on me. Because I realized that n- this all, like I wanted to stay at IE. I didn't want to go to mother uh, to go to, uh, to college. Then I wanted to go initially to U of M. <clears throat> then I wanted to go to UFC. I wanted to go to Northwestern. I was rejected at UFC Northwestern. I was waitlisted, and like I had all these different plans. But Allah had a very specific plan for me, and then um, the plan was to be on campus when this all happened. The plan was for me to sort of, uh, you know, I, 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 I left activism, came to the madrasa, and I was still very active on the weekends in these programs, still MSA, uh, not MSA, it's pre-MSA, MINA, all these things. Mm-hmm. And I came back to activism again. But then I needed another shaking, and that second shaking was there, where I sort of had to f- begin to really infuse in my life depth to the activism. And that's why I'm not, act- I'm not anti-activism. Uh, I'm just not pro act, uh, shallow activism, for lack of better words. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to mention any group that's involved <coughs> in shallow activism. I think everyone has good intentions, inshallah. Yeah, that's, sure. that's how we met. Yeah. Okay. So then, wha- once you met him, I mean, what transpired, wh- or what did you take away from the itikaf itself? So I've never seen grown men cry like that. I've never seen grown men cry like that. Um, one brother whose name I'm not, I can't mention because I don't know if he'll let me. Um, he would cry like so often. Just and I was looking like, why are they crying? Um, and that was a question I once posed to my father. We were at a Nisfa Shaban program at MCC, and Ma Naim Rahmatullah was giving a dars, and it was an Urdu. I didn't understand any of it. Mm-hmm. I just remember one thing: my uncle was crying, and I asked my dad like, "Wow, why is he crying?" He's, and he he's trying to explain to me that I didn't really understand, but like you know, out of fear of Allah. 
like one brother I remember we were studying Shema and then the Prophet has some hadith that mentions that a home that has uh, olive oil and honey and vinegar will be the home of barakah. And so he went because he wasn't in full time at Takaf, he would go to work and come back. Mm -hmm. He came back and brought a lot of those older guys there uh, these three items. And so um uh, I remember one of the brothers, he picked up the olive oil and vinegar. He looked at it, he smiled, then he started putting it on his face, started crying. I'm like, man, he's crying over olive oil and vinegar. Like, I don't understand like what's happening. But I, what I did understand was that this is something I needed. And so I eventually pushed really hard for Sheikh Hussein to accept me as a student. And you have to understand my background. I come from a Braille Khandan, and then I was, for many years, uh, part of Ikhwan, with the with peace nut, and then I had um, you know you, I, I, in college I would go on gush and stuff for Jamaat, and then I had my Salafi time as well where everything was bid'ah for me. Not all Salafis think that way, but that was the group I was mm -hmm. part of. Um, I, my my I, I dabbled in HT for a period of time as well. Um, so this was the first time I experienced anything like I felt like my heart was being affected, and so. When I when 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 I'm using terms like becoming a student or giving bea, all my baggage hasn't left. I still find a lot of things in the self to be problematic because my baggage. I come from a very um, um, loaded background. So when you come from a loaded background, you see things you, you can't just accept it. It's not like oh that was my background before, but I'm different now. So all those things were incorrect. I still find a lot of things in those groups to be correct. And so um, there were conversations that, that took place in that gathering where I had to understand what was going on, uh, what does it mean to become a student, etc. And that's where I sort of formalized my relationship with Sheikh Hussein, which really, may Allah reward him mm -hmm. an endless reward. Um, the, the effect that he's had in the Chicago and uh, even the national landscape <clears throat> is one that not many scholars have had up to that point. Since then, many scholars have come back. But that was a point where many of the scholars were still overseas. The, the Darul Salaam, Onuma was still overseas. Mauna Bilal was still overseas. Uh, Mufti Harun had come back. Mm. Um, you know, uh, Mauna Shraib was back. But the mo many of the younger, the, now they're no longer as young as they used to be, but this group had not come back yet. And so Sheikh Hussein was really carrying that. Uh, he wasn't obviously as old as you know some of the the elders of our community, like the Mufti Nawal Rahman or even Sheikh Amin, who's younger. But you know he wasn't that age, nor was he our age. He was like this bridge for us. I think he's eight nine years older than I am. Um, I think nine years older than I am. Uh, and and what he provided was that's the first time I wanted to go to the masjid. When we were younger, my my brother really pushed this masjid thing. My dad would go with him. I just wanted to go play intramural sports at school. I didn't care <laughs> for any of that. Um, so then now Fajr became something that was important. Uh, praying in the masjid became important. Learning deen. All those things that I think were missing in the activism stage. Uh, we would go to Isha. We'd recite our gardans of, uh, for uh, sarf. And then we'd come for Fajr, recite our next gardan. So he really tried to bring those things together. And it was a very practical tasawuf. Um, later things changed uh, for me personally and now I think I'm coming back around full circle to that practical to self. Um, and that's what I think America really needed and still needs today mm -hmm. that this this practical to self where you can have you can be a professional and you could be a family man or woman I mean, it applies to women as well um, but at the same time Allah is primary he's he's he, he's on top of the, the list of, uh, of of any one or any being I hate using those terms that you want to please and everything sort of comes underneath Allah so we went to the masjid but at the same time we finally I remember he would say things like how do you expect to do my my, my like and people are going to misconstrue this khidma does not mean like sitting there pressing feet Khidma means just helping in any capacity, like, hey, there's a program, can I help make the flyer, etc. Or there's a program, can I, you know, be in charge of something? Like, you know, how are you going to do khidma if you can't even do khidma of your parents? I'm like, oh, man, parents are really, really important. I have to get that going. Mm -hmm. Because in, in Sunday school, you learn it as a concept, but you don't learn it as a reality. You can't. The teachers, may Allah reward all my teachers in Sunday mm -hmm. school, um, they only get you for a half-hour window uh, on a Sunday and if you're in Chicago, that's the only day there's football. So now you don't want to be in class because you're waiting for football <laughs> at home or 45-minute window. And so it, it's a, it, they really persevered through a lot of our hating, for lack, lack of better words. But I, I felt like Sheikh Hussein really brought that together for me. Nice, mashallah. So is this when you first started with part-time studies? So 
And when I had left IAE, I still was going to continue part-time studies. I just hadn't formalized that plan yet. Mm-hmm. Um, I had spoke to uh, spoken to some of the teachers that, that I'm going to still return, and uh, you know I want to still continue the Arabic, etc. It, it was in the air, but now it had become formal, um, where we were going to begin to go through Arabic together with Sheikh Hussein, and then he had uh, teachers, unofficial teachers, that um, would also uh, help out. Mm-hmm. And then eventually enough people began to gravitate towards this program, uh, which is initially was called Mother's Soul Program. And then uh, you can still find it on like the, like, what's that m- website on the internet? Like MySpace? No, no, no. <laughs> not Zanga or MySpace. I think it's called like Time Machine or something like that. But I'm can, way too young for yeah, that. You, it, well, it's, it, it exists. You can go find old things that are not on the internet Oh, anymore. okay, okay. Yeah. That's what or you're Or like saying. Wayback Machine or something like that. Hmm. Um, so it's the Mother's program initially, and then he formalized it into a program where now, I mean, how many kids is he going to teach? So now what he did was he had some advanced students who can take us on and teach us the initial su- sciences, and then we began to formally study under them. Initially, it was one-on-one, which I'm so grateful for. And then it became small classes, but those one-on-one sessions really, I, I cannot, um, uh, I cannot... N- express how valuable it is at least for the foundational sciences if you're if you can be self-motivated which i wasn't but i didn't want to embarrass myself either if you have one-on-one classes it's really really worthwhile um and that's when i began to sort of formally study my part-time uh courses then i would return to IE to do some books there uh and uh, and then it became pretty much only sacred uh Mother Super Program became Sacred Learning. Mm-hmm. And then uh, then I had other programs I would still be a part of. Because Sheikh Hussain was very, uh, he, for anyone who's serious to study, uh, he would tell us that we, we should find other teachers that can teach us other books. So, you know, I, w- I would look for other teachers to, to teach us different books so that eventually we can, um, if the door opened, to go study, I'd be able to go study. So then you're moving between back and forth between IAE and then Madrasa. Mm-hmm. Madrasa Mother Sub program. Mother Sub program. Sorry, yeah. I think like I know there's something else yeah. to it. So between Mother Sub program and then you continue when it's changed to Sacred Learning. Yeah, at or that point. somewhere around. Yeah, that. around that time. Okay. Yeah. And then, so how long were you in the Sacred Learning program, or how long were you studying with Sacred Learning? From 2001 December, like pretty much right after I took off. Okay. All the way until I left to Zambia in 2013. Okay, so in between this time, what how much of the traditional alum course are you covering? When I got to Zambia and they and they had me take the uh, placement exam, mm-hmm. I placed in the second to last year. Okay. Um, to the Hidayah Mishkat year and uh, Hidayah Thani year Mishkat. Mm-hmm. There's some holes in my studies um, that I think anyone who doesn't go to Madrasa will have. We don't do as many books of Adab. So I didn't do Maqamat Hariri. I didn't do that. I didn't do... Um, um, and then there are some that, you know, for example, um, we, 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 like we had to study Fiqh Muyasir, Nuru Ida, Mukhtas Al-Quduri, Kanzu Daqaiq, Shara Al-Liqaya. But when I spoke to my class, they were like, we don't study all those. So th- in some places we did more, mm. in some places we did less. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So then in between this time that you're going... Or now you're in part-time studies. Um, were you able to? I kind of want to get into like you finishing your schooling, mm-hmm. getting married, and so on and yeah. so forth. So, well, I got married early on. I got married December 29, two thousand two. So a year after becoming Sheikh Hussein's student. Oh, nice. Well, yeah. So a year later, at twenty-one, I was married, and I was only um, in my technically my third year of college, but I was I was working full time at MCC at MEC, which is now MCC Academy. Mm-hmm. And um, as an Arabic, uh, Quran, and Islamic studies teacher. And I was also um, going to NIU in the evenings. So I would drive there. And then uh, I would, uh, and, I, and, I, and my wife and I lived apart. So mm-hmm. she lived in Texas finishing her degree. I lived over here finishing my degree. So that happened then. So that happened shortly after. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so w- when did you get, this is a question I always had in my head, actually. You... You've mentioned before in talks where your teachers told you not to speak. Like you were banned from <laughs> yeah. speaking for like a year or something A couple like that. of years, yeah. When was that? That was around 2004. 
Okay, so that's a little bit later. Yeah. So you get married. Um, there's a very famous incident that happens with you or something that you've told us growing up. You know, when you climbed the tree, you fell. Oh, yeah, yeah. There, there's, there's a version of it with uh, on on Imam, uh, yeah, I'm on us first channel, cons- Concise Advice 21. You said you got married, and then yeah. I know sometime after your marriage. Yeah. So after the Wulima. <laughs> um, so, so the version on Concise Advice, uh, may Allah reward Mona us for. I mean, <laughs> Hafizullah. Uh, he, uh, he asked me, like, can you give a small, like, talk and record it uh, about your fall? So I'm like, okay, if I have to give a proper talk and keep it short, I'm going to have to really try to condense it. Mm-hmm. So it was a 45 minute talk. He condensed that into 15 minutes. You can't even tell there's breaks. Like, oh, mashallah. I, yeah, I, like, yeah. I don't know how he did all of this. But anyway, um, uh, um, uh, we, this was, so um, um, my nikah was the end of, um, nikah was at the end of December mm-hmm. uh, 29, uh, of 2002. And then we have the Rukhsati, which is at the end of May 2004. So it's a year and a half. And uh, then, 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 then the Walima is in June. So after this, now we're finally living together. We go to Michigan. I had to give a talk at a camp, Camp Al Hilal, the Jinn camp. Yeah, so I had to give a talk at the Jinn camp. And I had another program. And I was really excited because I was supposed to speak with Imam Siraj Wahaj. It was like a childhood like idol for me. I was so excited. Like there's a program. And one of my friends was getting married. And so I went to um, I went for the wedding, and uh, I think I, I think I missed the nikah because we were driving up from from Chicago area from DeKalb. But I got there for the evening, uh, like the the, the the whatever the the, the 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 evening banquet, and then the next morning I met my brother, my sister in law, and her husband family's place, and um, uh, we thought okay, let's go for a walk or something. So we went to a forest preserve nearby. The imam who performed our nikah was there, and then. Uh, um, w- um, so he, my brother-in-law, for lack of better words in English, mm-hmm. and then uh, my sister-in-law, and then my sister-in-law, and my wife were walking together with the kids, with with my with my sister-in-law's kids, and then my brother-in-law, my the imam, and I were walking, and we're sort of ahead, and we come to like this sort of this platform. It's almost like a deck overlooking like a small river. So uh, I mm, there's a tree. So I thought I'd climb it. Cause I love climbing. Even when we went to Devil's Lake uh, a month or so ago, my boys and I saw this cliff and we began climbing it right away because that's what you do when you see these things. So we started climbing. I was about 10 feet up. Someone was like, go higher. Someone higher, 15, 20, 25 feet up. And it had rained the previous day. And I didn't know that. It didn't look like it. But some of the branches were a little dried out. So I wanted to go a little higher. And what I noticed was that I couldn't reach. So... I stood on one branch and I grabbed the other one over my head and I sort of pulled to see if it's if it's strong enough so I can hold it and take a step forward. Mm-hmm. And it was strong enough. I go and take a step forward. It was deceptive. It snapped at that moment. So I fell over, like almost in like, you know, like such the position for like, like, you know, just fell 25 feet and bam, I hit the ground. And my my wife saw it. She said, I saw the whole thing. And because uh, she heard the snap or she heard like a, a, like mm-hmm. a, like a yelp and she turned around and I hit the ground, and my stomach hits this exposed root, and it lacerates my hepatic artery. So now all this blood is pumping, but it's not going to my liver. It's just coming to my stomach. And literally, you can see my stomach growing, but the, there wasn't uh, any type of um, there wasn't type of uh, any type of cut. Uh, my, my 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 skin didn't split, so the the the, the blood was all internal, so all internal bleeding. And I felt my shoulder like something hurt. I found out later I broke my my shoulder blade, um, and it, my stomach was going like a, like you can imagine like a very f- uh, quick pregnancy type thing like the abdomen just filled with blood. Fifty percent of my blood val- volume was in my abdomen, and so I, you know, had they, I'm like I'm fine. Let's go, let's go. And my wife's like, No, you're not fine. <laughs> and, and it just hurt a lot. It hurt a lot. And uh, there's a pool nearby, and one of the lifeguards up there saw the fall, so she like called nine one one. The ambulance took forever to get there. I think it's a good twenty minutes to get there. Finally, they got me in, and they were very rough with me. They were very, very rough. And they stopped at every stop sign, every stop line. My wife, she told me this. Uh, when I got there, I remember I was just begging the doctor, just knock me out, knock me out, please. And I was awake for a couple of days. I was awake, I think, for two days. The third day, the blood volume. So they had to go through my leg and had to burn the hepatic artery close. And and, and the hope was that the, that the blood would seep into like the tissue and the muscles and sort of 
whatever it's supposed to do. But it didn't. And when I was laying on my back, the pressure started building towards my lungs, and my lungs collapsed. And when my lungs collapsed, that's when I coded, and they had to run in. I mean, I wasn't conscious for that. Um, that revived me, and they're like, let's do emergency surgery right away. And um, they went to, went to emergency surgery. I still happened to be in a community where one of uh, one of the brothers who I knew, one of the families I knew, just growing up um, from Mina and things of uh, from programs like that. Um, the father, Dr. Jundi, uh, may Allah preserve him. Uh, he did the surgery, and uh, it's funny because he's like, "This isn't. We don't know what's going on. The X-rays show like grade five lacerations, and there's all these issues." He's urinating blood. Um, you know, his lungs have already collapsed. It looks to be some problem with the, with the pancreas, I believe. Um, so, uh, people are making dua. A lot of people are making dua. Um, and may Allah reward all of them. I can never like enumerate how many people are making dua. And um, he, um, he told my parents it'd be many hours. My parents got a call, like, Saad fell out of a tree, and they're, like, laughing. Like, oh, he broke his arm. I always break things. Mm. Then they get a call saying, come right away. He might not live. And so they, like, drive up, like, fly up right away. Not fly, and they drove up very quickly. Um, they get to um, they get to uh, the hospital. I wasn't, um, I, 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 I may have been conscious when they arrived. There's a lot of weird things that were happening. I remember on the way into the, in, in the ambulance, like, I heard whispering. I think of Shaytan Allah because just been myself. It's basically making me question Allah. And I remember like, no, Allah is you know, I, I believe in Allah and I, and he would never leave me at this point. Um well, the, Dr. Jundi when he performed the surgery, he had told my parents that it's gonna take a very long time. We don't know how long it'll take, it'll be hours. He came out forty five minutes later. When he came out forty five minutes later, he, the natural response is like, Oh my god, like mm-hmm. it didn't work out and then he said, No, 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 it was successful and then he, he told me later and if I remember correctly, and I, and I documented this, so I think it's correct, but Allah on him, it could have just been like the, you know, the morphine, um, that he was, he was just speaking about, like, uh, like when we went to cut your stomach open, the blood, we were afraid that the blood would spill. It's like a popping a water balloon. That's the term that he used. But when they cut it open, the blood just sort of stood there. So they're able to do something to the blood. I don't, he explained it. I don't understand what it was. Then they went to the liver. The liver was already repaired. And they, he just had to remove a section of the liver. They went to the kidneys. The kidneys had no damage. And they went to the, he said the pancreas had some bruising, I think, but it was pretty much fine. And so what ended up being an exploratory emergency surgery really just ended up being a bit of a cleanup. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that's duas in action. And, uh, and uh, so what ended up happening was, I, uh, I mean, they kept me in a medically induced coma for another, I think it was 11 days or 11, 12 days total. And when I finally came to, my wife told me later that I didn't recognize everyone. I only recognized like, my parents and my siblings. I didn't recognize my wife. Because uh, oh, I, I was growing up. Like I was like a little child. Mm-hmm. Then I became like a, a like an older child. Like I would tell my mom, come on, mama, let's go. I mean, let's go. Let's go to the park. When I became like 15, my mind was like a very aggressive time in my life as a wrestler and stuff like that. Like, my brother was in the room and like I tore off like the wires and it's like blood and I grabbed like be a man and take me out. <laughs> and, you know, I had to call like the nurses and they had like bind my hands to the... <laughs> Uh, and then I finally got to a point where I was my age again, which at that point was 23 years old. Um, but yeah, it was a very interesting experience. It was a, it was a second wake up call for me. <laughs> like, <laughs> if, as if my roommate's death wasn't enough, I think for me, I had to be woken up a second time. And I had other stuff happen too. So I had Allah, Alhamdulillah, has given me a lot of wake up calls. I just have to learn to answer them properly. Inshallah. Yeah. Mm, so you mentioned in 2004, you get banned yeah. or your teachers say you're not allowed to speak so in the i i didn't understand this all properly now when i'm reading the, the stories of the akabir things make a lot more sense but they identify certain things that are problems and this is one of the needs of having a teacher you don't have to get bad to anyone you don't have to call it the soul just have a mentor over you just like you would have in residency or student teaching such have a mentor there and so my spiritual mentor if you want to take that 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 type of wording he pretty much said, I, 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 uh, you, sh- you sh- don't speak anymore. So I, I'm thinking, like, this is the height of my speaking career. Like, I just learned about this thing called an honorarium. Like, I never <laughs> knew that exists. Like, uh, you know, like, 
I would go pay my own way wherever I go to speak, and then you would just leave, and that was that was it. Mm -hmm. And so now all of a sudden, um, I remember some place from like it was Alabama or Kentucky would like, come speak, and and then I remember I was like, oh, you know, my, I'm not allowed to. And one of the, one of my teachers called me back, and he just like, if you want to speak, go speak. But if if my advice is important to you, then take it as your own as your own personal decision as well. So I'm like, oh, stuff! So I shouldn't have done that. I should really take these things more seriously. I, I'm I'm very immature, and I don't really recognize things quickly. He told me you're gonna have time later in your life to speak. You will have time to speak. But this is Sheikh Hussein. Um, and then um, just at this point, don't do it. So what do I do at that point? Like I. I don't do it, but at the same time, I have this desire. But then when he gave me that little rebuking, I, I, I went back and I, okay, I'm not going to speak. I made my own decision. I was at UIC at a MSA event because my brother used to go to UIC. Um, and, uh, and then my, my sister went to UIC, and then I just would go to events there. And I remember I was listening to a lecture there. I'm like, this content is awesome, but I can do so much more th a, a better job in the actual delivery. And as soon as I thought that, then I realized, oh, this is why I can't speak because there's this hidden arrogance inside of me that I have not been able to conquer. And at that point, I realized the wisdom for not having spoken that previous year and a half. And I wish now, in hindsight, I took the, that year and a half, two years more seriously, and I really uh, did, um, uh, I did a better job of, uh, of maintaining um, happiness with that request or that suggestion. Um, because now all we do is speak. <laughs> we mm -hmm. don't get to sit as much uh, and listen and learn. And so, yeah, that, that was that. Yeah, so, I'm a so I wanted to ask you about your Hajj. You went to Hajj uh, prior to your son being born? I went to Hajj. Allah Ta'ala blessed me to go to Hajj in uh, 2000. Um, when was it? In 2001. And then Allah Ta'ala uh, blessed me to go again in 2007. Oh, so, so you went one, once prior. Once before my son and before marriage as well. Before marriage. And, and then, then once after my son was born. Okay. Yeah. So can you tell me about those experiences? Or <laughs> let me ask you one question in general. Yeah. Um, what was your takeaway from Hajj? So one, one of the main takeaways, I need to go back and do it properly. Like <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't that many. I had a Hajj program back then. But there weren't really the Hajj programs that exist today back then. Mm -hmm. um, so in 2001, we went with Dakiyanko. May Allah really bless him. He mm. made it a goal. Like somehow he always ends up in the haram. He always either leading a hajj group or being some. He's always there every year. And so um, he had this thing called simple hajj. So it was two, the year 2001. So the, the, the package was 2001 and 2001. That was the package. Nice. You can't <laughs> imagine $2,001 for a hajj trip. We stayed in apartments. Uh, we just ran, got on random buses. I don't even know how. Mono Umar was there with me that first year. Mm -hmm. He wasn't Mono Umar yet. Um, and uh, my brother was obviously there. My brother and I went together. Um, it was an interesting experience. Uh, Mono Jawad, Azimuddin Jawad was there uh, in our group as well. Um, we didn't have a Hajj group leader. You need to have a Hajj group leader. Because there's things I'm like, I, 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 did, I don't think this went right. Wallahu mm -hmm. alam, you know. Um, and so one of the takeaways I got from there was if you can walk your Hajj. We walked almost the entire Hajj. Mon Omer and I walked almost the entire Hajj. Uh, my brother had fallen ill, so he couldn't walk it with us. Um, walk your Hajj. Why? If it's going to cause a problem in logistics or your group doesn't want it, don't walk your Hajj. But if you can get away with it, because there's so much time that you're not rushing and you're not worried about what people are doing to you. You know, people are like clamoring to get on the bus, and the lines are long. I'm talking about my 2007 uh, experience, mm -hmm. and I'm looking back. And uh, I'm looking back to 2001. There's, we're just walking, so and we know we have to get to a certain place before, uh, you know, after Maghrib we leave this place or we leave at Zawal this time. So we're fine, even if we get there an hour later than everyone else. That was an hour less of you know, oh, the bus is too hot, the AC is not working. Where's my tent, etc. It was just calm. And we ended up finding our tent. I don't know how we found our tent in hindsight. We just got there. Um, I would highly recommend walking Hajj. It's, it's a very uh, peculiar piece of advice, but it helps you stay away from people, which I think is necessary in Hajj. Uh, 2007, uh, 2006, Sheikh Hussein went with Mu'an Aziz. 
He was the English scholar. Wang Ziz was the or the, the main scholar, the Urdu speaking scholar. Uh, this was in Priceline, Hajj Priceline. I think called Hilal Hajj, Hilal Tours. Yeah. yeah. Um, with Iftikhar, so, yeah. you know, mashallah. I went yeah. with him as well. Yeah, he's <laughs> amazing, mashallah. He reminds me a lot of Sheikh Yunus from Zambia. May Allah bless that whole family. Um, his wife, Uthman, uh, his son, son Uthman. Um, so um, that year, I wasn't going to uh, This is the follow-up to Sheikh Hussein. Like, the, the, they had <laughs> completely the wrong idea of what I was going to bring to the table. I mean, I was just a student studying. My whole job, in my mind, was just to translate from Mona Z. Skari Manan was there as well. Oh, you're so, the group leader. English yeah, group. technically speaking, yeah, I was the English <laughs> group leader. Okay, nice. And uh, and then and, and I was told many times this is not how it was last year. I'm like, of course that's not how it was <laughs> last year. Like, but yeah, Malazi is my teacher. I'm not gonna speak in front of him. Yeah, you know, he taught me Qasana. He taught me a few different books. Uh, sure. You know, um, like I'm not. But anyway, that was a fun experience because um, we got to slaughter that year. That's and what I, I wanted to ask you. Yeah, about. he got a slaughter. Yeah, you have to slaughter. And we went into the mountains to slaughter. And we went, I don't know where, and we just kept going. And we stopped somewhere, and then, like, it's this our place. They said, Yeah, we go. And he's like, That's not our place. Then we went further up. And literally, as you're going up the elevation, the years are going back. We got to where we had to get to. It was a shed, it was like a tin shed. This person had a, um, a lungi. And like a like a tattered kameez, like like a like a like made of like almost looked like it was potato sack material. Mm -hmm. And he had a staff and he was just herding his animals. And then there's a couple of workers in like blue jumpsuits, but like it was like we went back in time. So uh, this is can you tell us in reference to the outskirts of Mecca? Or? I ha uh, somewhere in Mecca. I don't know where <laughs> like okay. I don't know. Like we just jumped in the back of a pickup truck and yeah. we're just holding on and they're just taking us up. So that you guys go stone and then, yeah, we go stone and then everyone's supposed to go back, but um, the the leaders, mm -hmm. and then I was allowed to go with them. The leaders mean like the, like the organizers of the trip. Yeah, if the Farsab and uh, Uthman, and they said I can come. It's like, perfect. I want to slaughter, and man, that was that was a crazy experience. But just to leave the city and to sort of relive what it must have been back mm -hmm. then was something that I can't uh, I can't put to words. But I don't know how many people will be able to experience that anymore. And so I was happy I had that opportunity to experience it, that what it must have been for the Prophet to, over, to look over at the haram from a mountain and just you know, sit in tranquility and, and just relax. We didn't have that same uh, the, the, the luxury of time because we had to slaughter, it was like 67 go 66 goats. And that was a whole different issue because we slaughtered a few and then they're like, okay, we're done. You come back tomorrow. And then if the Khar Saab comes back, like, what's happened? They said, don't do more. He's like, no, we're doing more. He turned the headlights on the car, so it's pointing towards the goats, and we're just slaughtering away, slaughtering away. Okay. Uh, Wait, so amongst the three of you guys, you guys are doing all the slaughtering for all of them, yeah, the yeah. Hajj group? Yes. Nice. Yeah, we just have the names. We're reading it slaughter, reading yeah. it slaughter, et cetera. Uh, it was pretty awesome. <laughs> on the way back, it was a crazy story. I don't know if we have time for it. We have more than <laughs> enough time. Wait, so uh, do you have to go after Salah? Uh, I have to go probably before Salah. <laughs> so oh, okay. Yeah, just, I mean, we'll do yeah. a part two. It's not a problem. No, no. Yeah, I don't know if we do a part two, but like, <laughs> uh, Uthman, Masha, I keep mentioning he's such a sincere guy. I really, my wife came on this trip with me. My wife and I, Zay was about a year and a half. We left him behind my parents and my sister, may Lord reward them. Mm -hmm. um, and my wife, uh, I remember leaving, like, I was like, we're never calling home. Like, let's just, and she's like, no, we're calling home. And so eventually we do obviously do call home. But, um, um, I don't. I actually never really got the full experience from her end. She sold her car to go. She she had a Volkswagen Beetle, so she sold it so she can go for Hajj. I remember we put it on eBay. One of our friends actually bought it off eBay. Um, oh no! Way. Yeah, it was weird because like his it was like some strange username, and then he was just telling me, "Oh, your car sold and this and this." I'm like, yeah. And I was trying to tell him that you can't buy; it's always sold on eBay. Like you can't. And then he's like, "No, that's me." I'm like, "Oh, that's cool." Uh, I fell back because he was offering anyway before I just sold it to him <laughs> in the first place. Um, so um, I felt bad. I sort of neglected her. There's one piece of advice. like If you're going to go to Hajj with your spouse, go once before. Absolutely. Definitely go once before. You do not want to go there as a first-timer. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I would do the off with my wife, I would make her stand in front of me. I would put my arms out around her mm -hmm. because people there, unfortunately, do not always have the best intentions. And um, one of the best things I remember I really enjoyed about that Hajj was the fact that... Uh, I look like such a fakir, and no one ever came asking for money. Everyone else in my group got hit up. 
but I just had like my, you know, like my like garments that I would mm. wear and like those, you know, what are those chapels that you buy, those slippers that you buy for a couple of reals? Yeah. Only once when one of my group members would speak to me, I would respond back in English and people would start coming towards me. But it was, it's so nice to just get away from the public eye. So, not that I'm a, a public person, but like, or but just sort of really blend into nothingness. Because when you go for Hajj, that's what you're, you're nothing. Mm-hmm. If you're wearing ihram or if you're just doing it in a way where you just won't want any in- attention, you just blend into nothingness, and it's it's awesome. Uh, yeah. So anyway. Wait. Yeah. So what did you do after you guys slaughtered the animal? <laughs> after we slaughtered, we piled what was it sixty seven or seventy six goats in the back of a pickup truck, some in the front of the pickup truck, the driver, the goats, if the kharsab, Uthman and I in the back, bunch of goats. We start coming down. And he's like, we're gonna distribute this to the poor by hand. We like, have to. I'm like, got it. We're gonna do it. We come down the mountain. We get to eventually. We're starting getting back to the city. Get to a stoplight. Or stop sign or stop light. Stop light. And there was a, p- a person who looked like he was needy. So uh, one of the, the two organizers, organizers called him. He said, you need to take a goat. And if you have any family, take one as well for them. So he like, oh, he did something in some language. I have no idea. And all of a sudden, like, people came out of nowhere, like, under the truck. They came out of nowhere. <laughs> There's hands grabbing the goats and... By the time they were, and, and then at one go, Uthman held on, and then like, uh, and then uh, and then like the person pulled his ihram, and he, and, and I'm like, uh, you know, you're, you're still in the ihram. It's like, yeah, yeah, you're right. And in a minute, like they were gone. Wow. Like, uh, and you know, I don't care. So they, they're saying, what if they sell them? I'm like, I don't care. Like these were poor people. They needed it. They mm-hmm. took it. Inshallah, they gave it to their family. If they sold it on the market, I don't know. Inshallah, that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. I don't know if at that period of time people are really selling meat either. I think it's just available. So we had the two in the front seat. So if the Kharsab was like, um, uh, well, okay, we had to get back before Fajr. And then I'm like, yeah, we do. So we stop off at a, at a, at a barber, and then we get our head shaved. And now we have this bag of um, organs, a certain organs that they wanted to make a stew out of. Mm-hmm. We have two goats. So... If the car, I forgot what happened. Pretty much, we're like okay, we're in a walk. So if the car stuff gets in the car, he goes. So I put a goat over my shoulders. It, there's like half of a garbage bag on it. So does Uthman, and we're walking, and we have blood everywhere because we've been slaughtering animals like all like in, like in the dark. We're walking, we're walking, and we're just people are like offering us money. I remember we met a guy from Boston just randomly. He's like, I'm here. I was I was just here for an engineering uh, assignment, but then I came and I got into Hajj. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. People are offering us money. We're like, we're not giving these two goats away at all. Like, these are our two goats. We can, after a while, like the top garments, getting, we just put cast aside. Now we're walking just the Izar up to the navel, and we're just walking with these mm. goats all the way back to camp. We get there like an hour before Fajr, and uh, we feel so triumphant. And we're like, what do we do with these two goats? Like, oh, we can't just <laughs> put them in our like sleeping bags in the tent. Like, what do we do with these? So finally, we're like, okay, <laughs> we go to these Zumzum, you know, those big like igloo, like yeah, the, yeah, yeah. what are those things called? Like, like those the dispensers? Yeah. yeah. So we dump the water out of it. We put ice and we stuff those goats into them to keep them cold. And the next night, alhamdulillah, whoever cooked it, we, 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 we really felt like we feasted because it's two goats, but we, we know how much we put into those two goats. And, but things like that, like you can begin to really appreciate like what it means to run between Safa and Marwa. Like, you know, when you, because you're not, you're, you're running out of desperation, Hajar is running out of desperation to sacrifice an animal. Like, we felt how much this animal meant to us because we just spent so much time doing it and now he can't take this away from us. How Ibrahim, how, must, how he must have felt at that moment with his son. So that's why I think just the more you're able to separate from some of these things that. And, and I, I get it why the group leaders do it. They're trying to make it easy upon everyone, and that's great. But the more you separate yourself, if you're able-bodied, there is a certain, like, love that you get, like a certain experience, certain taste that you get that mm-hmm. you can't get otherwise. So, yeah, and there's, a, there's some other stuff there that happened. <laughs> that I j- yeah, alhamdulillah. Thanks, yes, mashallah. Um, was there, I mean, how would you compare, or when's the last time you went back to the Haramain? So after that, we did not go. All the way until the way back from Zambia, my parents had gifted us. Okay, my parents so. and Muhammad Bhai had gifted us a um, a uh, a um, trip for. Uh, so how would you compare it from two thousand one to twenty fifteen? Yeah, two thousand one to two thousand seven to twenty fifteen. Yeah, um, it was very different. The first time I saw the Kaaba, I was ninety five or ninety six. Um, we went to India and then we went to Umrah, 
and it was under construction. The whole Kahlo was covered by white, oh, wow. big walls. And it was one of the most uh, disheartening things ever because like, you get there and you're like, oh, there's nothing there. Mm. Um, it's changed. The Harum itself had changed, obviously. There are much more buildings. The first time we went in tw- in, in 95 or whatever, um, we drove right out. The taxi took us to the gate of the Harum. Oh, and then yeah. we got out, and we didn't realize our bags were there, and we drove off with our bags. But uh, <laughs> um, th- just it's it's so commercialized. Um, it, it, it's sad, but I understand why they're doing it to make things easier. I, I I just don't like the way people shop. I think you should shop. You should give people who wor- who live there money, and mm-hmm. you should you know one of my teachers, Mufiel Jabbar, he would. When he would go buy his books, at one time, like he wanted to buy these two sets, and he couldn't afford both. The, the this is my Sahih Muslim teacher, Hafizullah from Zambia. He uh, he um, then basically said that, okay, you know what? I'll take this one. I won't take that one. And he said, just bargain with the, the person's like, just bargain with me. Mm-hmm. Um, because if you bargain, you can get both. And he said, no, no, no. Uh, our teachers have taught us that we don't bargain with the people of Mecca and Medina. Whatever we they ask, we give to them. So then that person said. Our teachers have taught us to honor our guests. So he said, you buy this set and this set's a gift for me to you. But yeah. like, you know, it, it's this things there that uh, I think is being lost. Now you go to these malls and you spend all day in these AC malls and eating at, I don't even remember the names of those places. Uh, I think people do need to go back regularly. Uh, regularly mean not like every year. They can if they want. There, there is a certain uh, desire to go that, that builds over a period of time. But regularly meaning that when they spiritually need it. Mm-hmm. They should make an effort to save money and go. And when they feel that, that yearning, then they should go. If it's too often, I think it could become a vacation, which you don't want that to happen either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So during this duration that, I mean, we've been speaking primarily about your studies, you're actually finishing up your undergrad. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so th- I wanted to ask you, so you began teaching at MEC Academy. Yeah. Right? And then you transitioned over to CPSA? I went back to school full-time. You went, oh, you're full-time in school, okay. Yeah, well, that, uh, I finished MEC J- June 2004. I filed the tree July 2004. So I went back to school full-time, but I had to pretty much uh, uh, wipe that year clean. Like, I couldn't go back to classes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so pretty much 2004, 25 was, uh, was a wash. And I didn't have much time left. I had very little time left to finish, get my degree. Um, and um, me, very few courses left to complete to mm-hmm. get my degree. And then I'm like, I got to provide for like my family. Like in that time, like I don't want to ask my parents for money. Like they always have been there, but I just felt, you know, I'm a husband, like I'm a man now. Like I have to like sort of do it. And that's not to be sexist. Like there's maru'a in our deen, there's chivalry in our deen. There's things like that that have to, they can't be lost. So I remember I had a Jeep Wrangler. I sold it. It was one of the hardest transactions ever made. I had to pay rent. Mm-hmm. I sold my Jeep and I paid rent. Um, and... Um, so I apply out. CPSA gives me an interview. Rockford gives me an interview. I end up the istikhara goes at CPSA. Uh, Mr. Qureshi, may Allah reward him. Allah He's uh, <laughs> whatever people have to say about their experiences, they can never deny that he has love for everyone. Mashallah. He might show it in different ways. He always had love for everyone that he that was under him. So they hire me to initially. And what's funny now, I have one class to graduate. Okay, I have. Mm. I have uh, my first year there, I had like a couple classes to graduate. Then my second year, I only have one class to graduate. And part of it was like a confusion because my legal name has an apostrophe. But a lot of like computer systems don't accept it. So they don't put the apostrophe in, but later began to accept it. So mm-hmm. they had to like rematch up these two personalities that are really one. <laughs> um, and then um, so that and like I had just to take a clap, ex- clap exam, clap exam, clap exam. And then um, when I'm done, and uh, so I'm pretty much sitting on 117 credit hours and like, I don't know what to do because they have to figure things out from their own end. Even after I finished, they still didn't graduate me because there was all these things in the back that just weren't, and then they emailed me or contacted me saying that we're going to have to restart your, like, I guess a certain amount of years to finish your d- degree by. Mm-hmm. And like, you're reaching like the eighth year and I'm like, but I'm done. Like I finished everything. What am I waiting for? Like you haven't finished this requirement. Like, I, I, How did I not finish this requirement? And I go back and I check. I'm like, that class there that you put over there belongs here. It's like, oh, yeah, it does. You're right. You're done. You graduate. Like, this was a big issue I had. Like, I couldn't graduate. Um, I mentioned that because the second year, uh, the first year, I teach summer school English. I teach college. Uh, I teach uh, ACT English. I uh, prepare for ACT exams. And then I teach gym, 
uh, Arabic, Islamic Studies, Quran, which is what I taught at uh, MEC as well. And the second year, the English teacher drops. Second year or the third year? Second year. Uh, it's the second or third year the English teacher drops, and I still haven't gotten my degree. And this is in the middle of September, and she's the AP teacher. Mm-hmm. And they're like, where are we going to find an AP teacher from? Finally, I think desperation over time, like, Saad, can you do it? I'm like, happily. So that's when I first got to actually jump into the English part. And by the time I was leaving, I was pretty much all English at that time. I was taking the AP classes. And that year was fun. That's when I had Yasin Chumsi in my class. Oh, and, awesome. you know, that was, uh, that, was, that was a fun year. I think uh, I had all, I think I had, I think it was 40% were fives. 50% were fours, and I think oh, I had, almost. yeah, almost everyone. And then, like, I had, like, one three and one two, I think. I'm not going to tell you which one is Yasid. <laughs> he could have been the five. I'm not, not saying anything. <laughs> but I, what I was saying is that, like, it was a very, uh, Allah really put a lot of barakah in that year and a lot of blessings. Sure. And I love teaching English because you can teach deen through English. And that's mm-hmm. what I always wanted to do, just teach deen through English. Nice, yeah. mashallah. And then, so, after you graduate, you get your under, undergraduate degree. In 2008. No, no, in 20... I started in 2001. I don't get my degree till 2010. Oh, wow. 2009, something like that. It's like 2009. It's, it's almost eight years. Yeah. Because the last three years, they couldn't figure out why. Like, I, ha- I had to go figure it out. Yeah, like, yeah. So, no, so be- before this, you're living in DeKalb. You're commuting between DeKalb and Lombard. Um, I'm living in Cortland, yeah. In okay, next Cortland, to DeKalb. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, and that, that was a drive, man. It was, and then one day, like my my car broke down, and like I couldn't afford a new car, so I take a taxi, and oh, it was just crazy. Yeah, there was a my wife was studying at IE, and if I took the car from her, her car, then mm-hmm. she can't study. Yeah, it, it, but it was so much fun. CPSA, like that was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. I think the students really make the school. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, schools are. I drove by CPSA on the way to. Uh, shy tea, uh, nice. but uh, <laughs> and I was looking at that new building, and I was thinking like this f- building in the front is so dilapidated, but the amount of memories and like what came out of it is just, it, it, it's amazing. But it's the people that really make it: the teachers, the students, uh, the facility. In the end, it's and they eventually rot. But the students and teachers, the the staff, uh, you know, office staff, uh, custodial staff, they really make it. And CPC was really enjoyable. Nice, yeah. mashallah. So then you end up going and transferring over to IFS? Yeah, yeah. There, there was a bit of an exodus from mm-hmm. CPSA for certain reasons. And so we had a group of us left to IFS. Okay. Yeah. And during this period, you're also pursuing your master's, correct? I start my master's and I go to IFS, yes. Okay, so you started afterwards. Now, how are you able, so the one question that comes to mind, how are you able to balance between... What, at that point, how many kids do you have, Mashallah? Uh, at that point, at IFS, I have two children, alhamdulillah. Okay, Zayd yeah. and Rahman. Yeah, Zayd and Rahman, yes. Okay, Mashallah. So, y- how are you able to balance between your family life, yeah. your work life, your school life, and then you also have private studies? Yeah. And then my wife is also studying privately, and my wife is also doing her master's as well. Yeah, it was... Uh, how, how do you manage? And then that? we... Uh, yeah, that was... Uh, it was hectic. Y- you know... I was very, I am, was, will be, inshallah, <laughs> very fortunate to have my wife. Like, I, uh, she hates when I talk about her, so I'm not going to talk about her. But, um, you know, um, uh, one thing I've, I've shared before, uh, 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 like, I never planned to marry my wife. That's something that came out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. If I told you the story about that, you'd be like, what? Like, how did that happen? And so, um you can see Allah's hand in everything. And I always tell people, like, look, when you do a stikhara for marriage, it doesn't mean you're going to have a good marriage. It means you're going to take something beneficial from it. Asiya radiallahu anha married the Fir'aun. Mm-hmm. If she married a believer or someone who'd become a believer, she probably had a comfortable life. Maybe she'd be poor, but she'd be able to worship Allah. But she would never be one of the four perfect women. She had to undergo that difficulty to get where she was going to go mm. and so i think uh, 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 i think i know allah knows how incapable i am so he put a very capable person in my life That's who true. can carry a lot of that weight for me uh you had to manage uh, the, uh, time management was very key which i'm poor, i'm a very poor time manager um you had to have an understanding family you had to sort of ex- understand that from the moment we got into the marriage one of the initial things i mentioned to my wife was um, r- r- I want to go study overseas. And she mm-hmm. had just come back from Syria at that point. So she said, I want to go study too. Her goal was to go back to Syria. We actually wanted to go, but it just may Allah alleviate the difficulty there. Mm-hmm. Um, so she, um, 
she wanted to study and she was prepared to study. She also wanted to get her professional degree as a counselor, as a therapist, which she is now. Okay. Um, I wanted to study. I also wanted to complete my teaching degree. Actually, I didn't really care to do my master's or my undergrad, but I was directed in that, 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 that direction by the superiors in my life who may be. Um, but in hindsight, it was all worth it. Mm-hmm. And you just have to give time. So when we spent time at home, you had to give time to the kids. And then when they go to sleep, you have to give time to each other or to your books or to your studies or to yourself. Like, And you have to find those hours. You just have to do it. Just like when you're in Zambia. You have two kids there, a third one on the way. When we got there, like at the end of the first year, we had another one on the way. And it wasn't easy, but you have to give time. If not, just accept that whatever you put in is what you're going to get out, plus or minus some baraka. But that, and so if you're not willing to put anything in, then you're not willing to get anything out. Explain, you explain yeah. like the drive, the focus, and things of that nature. Yeah. Now, I and Allah's want, blessing. MashaAllah. Yeah, th- yeah. That, that's what it is in the end. Like when, you, when, when I look back at my life, that's one thing I see. And anyone who has never read, they should read the autobiography of Malcolm X. MashaAllah. You will see how Allah works. Nothing is from us. I totally mm-hmm. understand that. When I, when, I was in a co- when I would drive back to IE for my classes, mm-hmm. one day I was driving back and uh, um, there was dry ice. This is from DeKalb. We're taking the farm roads back. There was, dry, there was black ice, not dry ice. And I, spun, I, I rolled over in my Jeep. I had oh. a rollover accident. And like, I had to call like, uh, like um, Mufti Asif, who wasn't Mufti Asif yet, uh, and uh, Hafiz Azam too, oh, was sure. a, Hafiz, to k- pick me up from like that area. Like, and I didn't know how to describe, like, how, where are you going to take me? Like, you know, like, so there's uh, just cornfields <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> just, it, 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 like, how, why did I survive that rollover accident? Oh. Like, you know, there's so much there that when people look at, uh, anyone looks at their own personal life, they have to find, that's the only way you escape insanity. Mm-hmm. You have to find Allah's hand in everything. Uh, and I don't mean this in an like, anthropomorphous way. Like, you have to find Allah's will in everything and just be content sure. with it. Our biggest mistake is we try to control everything. When mm-hmm. I was in Zambia, I tried to control so much. And finally, when I'm like, okay, I'm not controlling anything any, anything anymore. That's when things were really working out. Allah. Like, I'll mention it later, but like, we, we were, the place we're supposed to stay at, someone else occupied who didn't need the home. Oh, wow. But wanted the home. And could have very well afforded a, a nicer home that wasn't close to mothers, et cetera. But for some reason wanted the home. And they're mm-hmm. good people. I'm not saying in, in, in any bad way. But Allah wrote it for them. And so we had to stay with Mona Omar's family for a bit. And then we find this one place which is too expensive. Like, we'll do it anyway. And we only get that place for one year. And we, they didn't tell us that. That was supposed to be as long as we wanted. But something happens in their family that forced us to leave. We literally had that home from the point where my, my wife became expecting with our daughter to the point like like a week or so after she was born. Sure. It was like as if it was only meant for that period of time. And it was there's a lot. So like a person has to just give up. And then we move into, and I'll mention this at a different time, move into this one place that's like has been occupied for months. Probably gin's in there. It's filthy. It's broken. Mm-hmm. And we have so much fun there. It's like we would never expect an American family. We loved it there. Um, the, the, no cold water that entire, no warm water that entire mm-hmm. year. You know, no electricity most of the time, and it's yeah. just so awesome. So I, I, I think people have to just let go of con- seeking control, and that's when, and then they realize Allah's in control, and it's best for them to be in control. Mm-hmm. You're good. Mashallah. So let me ask you some closing <laughs> questions. Um, why did you? Why did you become a teacher? <sighs> I wish I could say something like <laughs> The Prophet <laughs> said this So that's why No, the reality was That I didn't want to become a lawyer And I wanted to go and uh, study in, And it just one led to another I liked English I, I had some good English teachers I felt like this would be a good place for me to teach English Over time, the intention changed I could really teach Dean through English Books like Picture of Dorian Gray And the Screw Tape Letters Like You can teach a lot of Dean through it but um, yeah. Initially, I don't really know. Yeah, uh, but man, I, I thought you're gonna be like, man, my mom was a teacher. I was my school. mom was a teacher, <laughs> and her dad was a teacher, <laughs> and my father was a weekend school teacher and a part time teacher at the uh, city colleges. But that wasn't it. <laughs> <That's> not, <laughs> not, not at all. all. <laughs> no, man. It was just Allah had really opened that door for me uh, to recognize that I enjoy English and I enjoy interacting with people in this capacity. Okay. So, what drives you on the day to day to teach students? Ah, man, it's hard. It's hard to be a teacher because, um, you know what it is? It's really those moments. There's like, I know it's, it sounds so cliche, but 
it's like you have a moment that's special and it makes you forget everything before and everything after. Like mm-hmm. if you have children and they can annoy you all day, but they might like smile or do something funny and you forget all of that. Yeah, yeah. And so that it teaching's the same way. Like there's moments like when we would have our morning halakas right in front of Miss Lodi's room, yeah. that made me forget about the rest of the day and the previous day. It oh, just, that's amazing. I probably upset you a lot of times in between that no no <laughs> uh, every yeah. morning there's like a cleanse <laughs> yeah there it is I mean, and then i have to go take attendance and go check <laughs> uniforms but you know if, uh, aside from that like, it really it removes everything i don't know what it is and people laugh and they say oh you're not being serious i'm really being serious because honestly what about the semicolon is going to make me want to teach it the next day it's english grammar it's dry but you know when you see a student i, I was just reading i saved the letters for my students Always like every time we went, but I, as of late, I started recycling them because I'm like I'm living in the past. So when I was when I was moving, I found a box that hadn't recycled. Mm-hmm. So I read through them. I'm like, oh my god, this happened, this happened, this happened. And you know, I always joke with people like, uh, I'm like you know, these kids they graduate, they never invite me to one of their weddings. But then someone reminded me like, hey, I invited you to my wedding. I'm like, yeah, everyone whose wedding I was invited, I never attended. <laughs> and anyone who didn't invite me, I was like, hey, you didn't invite me. But like you see that oh, they had children or that they are doing A, B, C or X, Y, Z. And you're like, man, alhamdulillah. Even with you, like sitting here, look at this. I'm like, man, there's a point in time where I was actually, you know, playing basketball with that young Morsi who had the long hair and then, you know, you know. Very out of shape, yeah. <laughs> no, you were, you were not out of shape. You, you had good cardio. Yeah, good yeah. Oh, you you were also my gym teacher, so yes. you know. Yeah, <laughs> that's the first time I ever ran a mile in my life. Oh, really? <laughs> I was really. I don't even know if we actually did the full mile. I think we walked it to Seven <laughs> Eleven and back. I I was really serious about gym. Physical education uh, is really important to me, as you can tell through the Hufsa programs. Yeah, I'm sure. It's really really important to me. For me, it helps my psychological health as well. My mental health benefits directly from it, and the lack of it really hurts me. So I think kids have to. I was looking at a video on YouTube. Uh, like a month ago or for and I was sent it to our admin like gym PE in the 1950s and 60s if mm-hmm. you see these videos they can do like classes were doing muscle ups wow, we got a pull up they're doing muscle ups and like they JFK had set the country on a trajectory to challenge itself physically mm-hmm. this was the Prophet's world the Sahaba were challenged physically, they were challenged psychologically, they were challenged emotionally, they were challenged financially, and they met those challenges. We sort of began to cut away a lot of these things, and then we're like, why, why aren't we there? Because we haven't taken those initial steps to get there. We sort mm-hmm. of just, you know, destroyed all those steps, and just, you know, and then now it's just too high to reach that plateau, so or that cliff. Alhamdulillah. Um, Jazakallah khairan for oh, yeah, joining us. Um, you can find this man somewhere on the streets of uh, Glendale Heights, maybe rollerblading. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> but if you do catch him, don't ask for one minute of his time because <laughs> it's a long minute. <laughs> yeah. That, 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 so those of you who don't know, like when I was an imam, one thing I noticed was like, if you always say, I need a minute, the closer that your thumb gets to the tip of your finger, the longer the conversation will be. Someone's like, I need one minute. Like that's gonna be longer than a minute. <laughs> uh, alhamdulillah. But no, it, it's been it's been fun. Yeah, I have no problem coming back later. But I, I have a list of people you should interview instead. No, definitely, yeah. we'll talk about that. Inshallah, uh, Jazakallah Khairan for everyone uh, joining us. Uh, tune in next time. Inshallah, we'll go through. Um, we didn't even get to Africa. Going to Zambia, coming back. You know, going. You know, not teaching anymore. Becoming an imam in the in the American concept. Yeah. And then moving on after Imamat, going full circle back to teaching as well. Yeah. And then where Sheikh Saad is now today. Uh, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair.